I like it when people are enthusiastic. Are you glad to be here this morning? Yes. Yeah. You know, some Christians look like they were weaned on a dill pickle and baptized in lemon juice. I mean, it's just... And, and it's like, yes, I'm happy. I have the joy of the Lord. And it's like, okay then, that's convincing me. We're talking about enthusiasm today and this idea of what does it mean to look like Jesus? What does it mean that our lives are being transformed to be more like Him? And it means we are enthusiastic about our relationship with God and we are enthusiastic about relating to people. That as you move spiritually, those two things are going to happen. And I like it when people are excited about a new diet, unless they're trying to get me on it, uh, when they're excited about a, a new thing that they're doing or a new grandchild. And when somebody's enthused, they don't have to tell you, you can see it, can't you? There's a sparkle in their eye, their body language, they want to talk about it. And my question for you as we start this message is if you were dead honest, what's your enthusiasm level about your life in Christ right now? On a scale of one to a hundred, of all the things that are going on in your life, how much does talking about Jesus and thinking about Jesus and, and knowing his plan for your life, how does that, does that build enthusiasm in you? Or have things settled down to kind of lukewarm? And we're going to talk about two things that Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 that are going to make a huge difference in your enthusiasm level. And I want you to do some honest evaluation. When you sang worship songs, was there enthusiasm? When you're hearing about somebody else's life and what Christ has done, is there enthusiasm? Or would you have to say, well, it's just kind of normal. And I believe that God wants to stir us up, and I believe that he wants to teach us from the passage this morning. So we're going to walk through Romans chapter 12, and I hope that by the time we're done with this series, you can kind of think through the chapter for yourself. The reason I chose the word enthused is because enthusiasm is a feeling of energetic interest in a particular subject or activity and a desire to be involved in it. Isn't that a good description of how we should feel about Jesus? Enthusiastic, energetic. And, and actually, the word enthusiasm comes from the Greek, in theos. The God in you is stirring you up. And of course, in the Greeks' minds, it was the gods. But it was this idea that the more I have of that relationship with God in me, the more it's going to come out in an energetic interest and a desire to be involved in it. So let's look at the verses that we are focusing on this weekend. 10 and 11 says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal or enthusiasm or in spiritual energy. But keep your spiritual fervor. That means not lukewarm, but steam. Serving the Lord. As you walk through the chapter 12, you think about, he says, in view of all that God's done for you, in view of God's mercy, you come, first of all, with a sacrifice of willingness of turning your life over to him. And then don't let the world conform you to its style, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then we think about ourselves with humility and, and soberness so that we're not thinking we're above others or feeling insecure. Then he talks about our spiritual gifts and how he has a will for our life that involves how he's equipped us to serve. And last week we talked about love must be sincere and hate what is evil and cling to what is good. And I hope as we go through this passage very slowly, you begin to feel like, I own this thing. When you say Romans chapter 12, I'm going, yeah, I know what that is. And more than that, I believe it. And when we're looking at the section we're talking about, there's kind of a bunch of bullet points. Do this, do this, think this, pray this, be aware of this. And, and I think often people look at it as a to-do list. Let me change your, your focus a little bit. I think these are brush strokes, painting a picture of what it looks like as God transforms you to be more like Jesus. That what's going to happen? You're, you're going to be committed to each other. That for Christians, relationships are critically important. In fact, that's the, the first emphasis we want to take out of this verse is we want to fight for better relationships. You know, Christians ought to have the best, deepest, most authentic, wonderful relationships with each other and with those who are not yet followers. 
In fact, somebody referred to our church a little bit disparagingly as, well, that's the relationship church. It's like, okay, we can own that. You see, our four values are transformation. The R stands for? Oh, come on. I gave you a so easy pitch. (laughs) R stands for? (laughs) Yeah, there they show up. The I, trim, transformation, relationships, innovation, and the M stands for? Multiplication. Nobody gets it. These these sermons are available online if you'd like to go back and renew. (laughs) We want to fight for better relationships. So ask yourself in your life right now, are the relationships of the people around you, are they close and connective, and are you moving each other spiritually, or do you have kind of a string of broken relationships behind you? You don't know how to connect with people, and you don't know how to keep the relationships going. In fact, I use the word fight for better relationships because I am of the opinion that you really don't know if somebody is a close friend of yours until you've had a problem and you've worked it through. Until then, you're still in the honeymoon. And when you fight for relationships, it means I know people are going to disappoint me, people are going to hurt my feelings. It's it's not always going to be that we have the same ideas about everything. It's that I'm going to work at having a devotion to the people that God puts in my life. I'm going to be committed. I am going to work at those relationships because you know what? All the tasks that you do will disappear. The relationships you build are forever. People last. And so we sometimes need to rework our priorities to say, I need to work on my relationships. And last week, Pastor Sky talked about, it's not what I want from you, but what I want for you. So often we are working our relationships to get something for ourselves. And this switch has to come to say, what am I adding to, you, to this relationship? And in fact, he says it here very specifically. He says, I want you to give honor. Give honor to one another. Now, what does that mean? What does it look like to give honor? Well, let me give you an illustration. Jan and I just finished building a house, and she was very, very involved in all of the color choices and design and all that, and I did a lot of the actual nailing things down and putting the screws in the deck. And every now and then when we're taking people through the house, Jan says, and we built this deck. (laughs) And you know, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, pretty sure I was out there by myself a lot of the time. Because what does our old nature come and want to do? I want to have credit, right? And whether you admit it or not, you have a very sophisticated calculator in your head of whether you're getting the credit you deserve or not. Are you getting the honor that you think you should get? And Paul turns the corner on us and he says, I want to ask you a different question. Are you giving honor? In fact, in those exchanges, do you give more honor intentionally than you try to get? Do you give people credit? Do you try to raise their standard? Do you try to draw attention to what they've done? Or do we subtly want that appreciation for ourselves? And I'll tell you, if you're like me, there's that subtle desire to want to get credit for ourselves. And so Paul says, if you're going to improve your relationships, be devoted to each other, fight for relationships, and Wouldn't it be cool if everybody, every day this week, thought, in my life, I'm going to give more honor than I get every relationship? So let me give you a little just thought process. What does it mean to give honor to somebody? How do you honor people? So this is where you talk. That's not rhetorical. How do you honor somebody? Compliment. Compliment. Thank you. Appreciation. Give credit. Tell them that they did a good job. Let me give you a couple of ideas. Turn your sheet over if you're taking notes there. On the other side, it says ways to give honor. Appreciation. It's amazing how well we teach kids to say please and thank you and we're not that good at it ourselves. Sometimes you, you say it in a, an appreciative way, just thank you, but boy, what does it make a difference if you write it on a card or if you make some 
great opportunity. Or maybe you publicly acknowledge, you brag on what they did for you in front of somebody else. Boy, this guy is so good at this, and they've done such a great job, and I just want them to get credit. If there's other people hearing you that, you know, like, increases the number of honor points. Careful listening. You know, it's one of the most honoring things you can do to somebody, is listen to what they want to talk about. Draw them out. Don't try to top their story. Don't try to cut them off. Don't interrupt. Listen. Encouraging card, encouraging words, caring about your interests. Oh, really? You're interested in that? Why, I would like to know more about that. I'll tell you, the fastest way to get to know somebody is find out what they are interested in and let them tell you about it. The, the side benefit is you learn a whole bunch of cool things. What about if you give a thoughtful gift? The right time, the right person, the right thing you've heard them say that they like and, and you give that gift and say, here, I'm... I'm honoring you. Now, here's a couple of insights about that. This is a generic list. Pretty much, you could do this for anybody and it would be good. But people are individuals. For some people, public acknowledgement is not that cool of a thing. They really don't like attention drawn to themselves. For some people, it's like a 10. For others, maybe a minus two. And so, here's a the, here's the critical question. It's like love languages. The people in your life, what is it that honors them the most? What is it you could do to give honor? And and you're thinking, well, I'm not sure they deserve it. That's kind of the point, you know? They don't deserve it because you're keeping score of who gets the credit. What if you gave them a little more than they deserve? Because you know what we want? I want more than I deserve, don't you? What if we gave that away? So Paul gives us some very simple ideas for how do we improve our relationships to be devoted to each other, to give honor. And then he moves to that next phrase where he says, I want you to be operating at spiritual zeal level. I want you to fight for spiritual passion. I want your enthusiasm for Christ to not be in the lukewarm range, but to be hot. And you know, if we're honest, our enthusiasm for God and the things of God and the scriptures, it goes up and down. And what you've got to recognize is that he's saying this as a command. He says, I want you to be never lacking in zeal. I want you to keep your spiritual fervor. So in some ways, and I'm going to draw some parallels, to not just physically being in shape, But there's a direct correlation. The better shape you're in, the more energy you tend to have. And so in the same ways that you have high or low physical energy, so you can have high or low spiritual zeal. And and this is the key point that I think you've got to walk away from this passage with, is that when Paul says it's your job to keep your spiritual steam up, You know, people say, well, I'm not going to that church because it doesn't really get me going enough. Whose responsibility is it to keep you at a spiritual steam level? You see, this is a very simple statement. This is, I am responsible for my own spiritual enthusiasm. It's like saying, I don't believe in gyms because there's lots of obese people around. Hmm, is it the gym's job to keep you in shape? Is it your trainer's job? Is it your coach's job? No. One of the most basic parts of your spiritual life is you've got to quit expecting other people to do it for you and realize that God has already given you all the resources and he wants you to manage your spiritual enthusiasm. So I want you to say this out loud and I want you to say it as an acceptance of responsibility. I am responsible for my own spiritual enthusiasm. Which means that when I find myself at a low level, I have to do something about it. I have to take responsibility and say, how do I make a difference in my own spiritual level? So this idea of fighting for your spiritual passion, the simple start with is you've got to plug the leaks. Where is your spiritual passion leaking out? And I will tell you that by far the majority of places where your 
passion is leaking out are called sin. It's when we allow the world to conform us to its mold, just like we talked about in verse 1. When we allow the attitudes and the activities and the priorities of the world to begin to shape our life. When we no longer worry about what God says about sin, we just kind of compromise with the world. When we allow our minds to be filled with things that are not from God and they're not right and we absorb ourselves with all kinds of things. And for many people, in both the physical energy and spiritual energy, there are huge heartbreaking things that happen. That you can go through a time of dealing with chronic illness, maybe the rest of your life. You can go through a, a bout of cancer, a battle, or, or an accident, or some kind of huge life event. And if you're an athlete, then you've got to go through a whole rehab process. But these kind of big life events can also drain your spiritual passion because it can introduce doubt. How did God allow this? Why do I have to struggle like this? What is suffering about? And, and that questioning of God, listen carefully, it's a normal response. It's an okay place to visit. It's just a lousy place to live. That you have to rehab after that. You have to go through a process of learning to trust God again and committing yourself to Him. And in view of all that He's done, you're going you're to go again and follow Him wholeheartedly. So there are big events that can drain our spiritual passion. The irony is it's those same big events that can also build your spiritual passion. Because sometimes they strip away all the things that are not eternal. And they leave you with the things that really matter. I'm afraid that most often the leaks that kill our spiritual passion are the same kind of leaks that kill our energy. They they have a nice word they use for in America now. They say we have a sedentary lifestyle. It kind of means we sit on our duffs a lot, right? And the more you sit, the more you want to sit. Is that true spiritually also? Mm Mm-hmm. The more you don't get involved, the more you seek your own comforts and pleasures, the more you do what you feel like doing, the more you're on your own, the more you can get isolated, the more you get pulled away. It's part of why the scripture says, don't forsake the assembling together. We need each other. We have a tendency to, the coal goes out when we're not with the rest of the fire. And so in the same ways that you can lose your physical energy, it's what we do with our lifestyle, it's what we eat. And if you fill yourself with junk food, It's not that close to noon, you guys should be okay. (laughs) When you fill yourself with junk food, what's it do to your energy level? Yeah, well in the same way, when we fill ourselves with spiritual junk food, it affects your mindset, it affects who you are and how you're living and what your priorities are. It affects your spiritual passion. So you can't just say, boy, I wish I were more enthusiastic and drum it up. You have to build the things that build spiritual passion. There was a funny story we, from uh, my early days in ministry as a youth pastor, and I was leading a guitar, or I was leading worship with a guitar, and we had a whole group there from a Bible club called Awana, and that was their Sunday, and they had worn their little uniforms, and they were all sitting in one section of the, of the church, and the, the pastor I served with was a fairly formal guy with a suit and tie and kind of spoke formally, and... Um, one of the things that they did to try to help these kids be enthusiastic is they would say, how is your PMA, your positive mental attitude? And they would respond in chorus, boy, am I enthusiastic about serving Jesus. So it was just kind of this way of getting them a little pumped up. And so Mark's standing up there and I hand it over to him, worship is done and he stands up there and he looks at these kids and he says, how is your PMS? And they did just what you did. It was really hard to get on with that service, I tell you. It was, and I'm saying, Mark, PMA, PMA. And of course, the funniest part is that the kids for whom he was aiming it to didn't understand it a bit. So, but they sure thought it was funny. How is your spiritual enthusiasm? Are you excited about serving Jesus? Are you, are you, would you say, I'm, I'm fervent? 
And I will tell you, all the way through your life, Satan would love to destroy your passion. He would love to destroy. If he can't keep you from following Jesus, he at least wants you to do it at a very low level. And so it's a battle. So how do we maintain a spiritual passion? Well, let me give you a couple of clues here. It means that I need to schedule my time carefully. The things that build your spiritual passion have a lot to do with what you spend your time on, what you fill your mind with, what you believe are your priorities, how you live a given week. And you know, Pastor Skye said last week that one of the fruits of the Spirit is gentleness that he had kind of missed in the list. You know, one of the fruits of the Spirit is also self-control. I don't think that's most people's favorite fruit of the Spirit. But Jesus lived a very integrated, full-focused life. He, he knew what he was about, and he used his time very well. And so the first thing we need to do is, I need to schedule my time with God. If I'm going to have spiritual passion, it means that I lift up my empty cup, and God fills me up. And you need that at least every day. And here's the real question, I think, what it often comes down to. Is it worth an extra half an hour getting up in the morning to spend time with God and to read the scriptures and to spend time focusing my life on Him? Is that worth more than 30 extra minutes of sleep? You see, sometimes it's the little decisions you make at the beginning of your day that influence your whole day. And I don't mean getting up because, oh, I've got to read my Bible, I've got to check it off my spiritual list. I mean when you begin to see God as the source of everything you most deeply need, then you begin to read the Bible with a different motivation. I want to know who God is. I want to have a clear picture of who he is and how he is running the universe and how he has a plan for my life. I want to, I want to learn what the Bible says I am. <laughs> the Bible says I have a deep tendency towards selfish ambition. I want the credit. And it's like, yeah, that's true about me, Lord. I confess that. And the Bible also tells us what lasts and what matters. What's going to be important for your day? And when you reorient your mind and reorient your heart and get your cup filled up, then you will live your day differently. So it's how I spend time with God and why I do that and how that impacts the internal workings of my, my, my mental dialogue with myself and with God. And then the second thing is how I spend time with the right people. How I spend time with the right people. Hear that carefully. And I want to give you a, an important idea that was out of a book that I read a number of years ago. And it was called Restoring Your Spiritual Passion. It's by Gordon MacDonald. It's actually listed on your outline there. And you know, I, I don't know about you, but when I read a book, often there's one great idea that comes and sticks with me out of that book. And there's some other good things in there. But he talks about the fact that there are five different kinds of people in your life. And how you choose to spend time with these people will impact your spiritual passion. So on the right-hand side of your notes there, it says V blank P. I'm going to give you five groups of people, and I want you to write in the initial and then write the word out there of these five groups. And as I walk through them, think about who in your life fit in these categories. So the first group is the very inspiring people. They fuel your passion. These are often people that you are, are your mentors or coaches or they're your encouragers. They're usually further along in the spiritual journey than you. And sometimes it's a deep, close, personal relationship. And God has brought people into my life at regular intervals who pray for me and challenge me and encourage me. And, and spending time with them is wonderful. So who are those inspiring people in your life that, that draw your attention to? And, and when you watch their life, you're thinking, man... I wish I was like that. I told Jim Belmore when he came to church, I said, God brought you here to show me what kind of an old man I want to be. We need those people that are challenging us out ahead, don't we? And then the next group, so, so that's kind of like the coach who comes along and says, I want to teach you, I want to encourage you, I want to train you. And then the, the next group are the very important people in your life. These are your peers. These are people that are usually at the same spiritual status that you are, or the stage you are in your journey. And sometimes they're in your same life stage, sometimes not, but they're people, listen carefully, they're people who run with you. 
They share your passion. These are the people you spend time with when you're doing things serving God together. They're the people that, like when, if you have an exercise buddy that says, no, I don't care if it's raining, we're, we're running this morning. And sometimes you need that extra little bit of motivation because, you know, the atmospheric pressure on top of your covers is incredible. <laughs> and you need people around you that go, come on, let's do this. You going to church today? I'll save you a spot. Those are the people that we run with. I'm going to sign up for that. Why don't you come with me? Let's do this together. Are those critically important people to your spiritual passion? I hope you have a list of those on your sheet, of those people. And then there are people who are very trainable people. Our motto, our mission is people helping people find and follow Jesus. And so the great question is, after you have been poured into and after you have run this, are you willing then to begin to find somebody who has spiritual velocity, who has an EQ, willingness to work with people, and they are teachable? And you move from being the trained to also being a trainer. See, that's where that M value comes in, a multiplication, where we say, how is it that I am taking what I've learned? God's filled my cup up, and I don't have to fill your cup. I just have to empty mine. Isn't that an encouraging thing? You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to provide everything they need. You just have to pour out what God's given you. And if you're a parent, I hope you're already working on this with your kids. Now, I have had an exciting experience as I've walked through this process over the years and you know what's the exciting experience? Is when somebody who you began coaching and you poured in and they were trainable and then they become a peer. And I poured into Pastor Will for years and we met weekly and, and now we are peers and he challenges me and asks me great questions and, and we're running together and sometimes he's coaching me. You see, it's a fluid thing. It's not I'm higher than you and I'm gonna pour into you. But you know, I think one of the acid tests of a church is that if I could take a new person or a new couple who've come to faith in Christ and they need somebody to disciple them, could I come to you and say, I'd like you to spend about 10 weeks with them and tell them the basics of the scripture and the basics of walking with Jesus and just get them started? If I asked you, would you be ready to do that, could you say, yes? And you know the sad thing? Sometimes people have been sitting in church for 25 years and you bring them a new Christian and you say, could you begin to disciple them and pour into them? And they're like, no, I don't know enough. What have you been doing for 20 years? See, that's the problem is that we often educate for information instead of transformation. And wouldn't it be cool if everybody in our church family could say, I would be happy to pour into somebody who is a new Christian. I would look forward to that. That would be a great privilege. And you say, how do I do it? Well, it's different with each one of them, but you could do it. And I'll tell you, you I'm sure you know enough. You just may be too afraid. So if we're going to become a church of multipliers, it means everybody has to learn how to walk people through those stages. That's a good acid test for your life. It's a good acid test for us as a church. Then there's two more categories, what he, he brought up in this book, which I thought were interesting. He said there are very nice people. These are the people that don't catch your passion. They don't pour into your passion. They draft off your passion. They enjoy it. These are the people, if you decide to run a half marathon, they come along the side and go, good job. There are nice people all around. And then there is another category, and you may have names for these. These are called very needy people. And they're trying to drain your passion. They're trying to draw off of your passion. And the good news is that sometimes nice people can become trainable people, and needy people can become trainable people. And as you pour into them, God can begin to work into them. Now here's the insight I want you to walk away with. Jesus spent time with all five of these groups but he didn't let any of them dominate his life. Of course, in Jesus' case, his inspiring person was in the middle of busy ministry. He pulled away and went to pray. He spent time with his father. He had 
not only the disciples he was pouring into, he had three special ones, Peter, James, and John. And when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, thinking about our salvation and what it was going to cost him, he said to those three guys, would you come with me and would you watch and would you pray? And he was in such distress that literally sweat drops of blood came on his forehead. And you know what his very important people were doing? They were sleeping. Now, they, they, they failed in that need that he had. And obviously he poured into all kinds of people. But Jesus also went to weddings and just hung out with people. And he sat with the Samaritan woman who had been married five times and was now living with somebody who wasn't her husband and lepers and blind people. But he didn't let any of these people dominate his schedule completely. See, I think this is the insight for spiritual passion is you can't just pull away with your inspiring people and get a holy huddle where you're going to go saying, I just wish we could stay here forever. That's heaven. That's not now. Nor do you have just people that are at a peer level. You're training people. You're loving people. You're helping people who have deep needs. And in the process of that, God is filling your cup and you're emptying it and he's filling your cup and you're emptying it. And that's what he calls not pastors and missionaries to, that's what he calls everybody to. And so managing how you spend time with these groups of people will make a huge difference in your spiritual enthusiasm. Ironically, when you're training other people, you always grow more. If you say, I wouldn't know how to disciple somebody, then it's like, well, start. You'll figure it out as you go, as you go along, right? And then there is another category that wasn't in this book, but there are some people that are toxic. They're against your passion. They don't want to follow God, and they want to talk you out of it. And sometimes you have to say no to those people because they are draining your passion. So here's the summary of what we've talked about that how I manage to give honor and devote myself in relationships with people and how I keep my spiritual enthusiasm are tied together because my relationships with God and my relationships with people fuel my spiritual enthusiasm. When you're pouring into somebody and you're seeing God change their lives, there is nothing better than that. And when somebody gives you a new insight that you never really thought of things that way before, it blows your mind. It's an exciting and eternal way to live instead of just punching the clock and getting through the day. And so here's the summary. I am responsible for my own spiritual enthusiasm and I impact it through the decisions that I make every day. Your enthusiasm goes up, your enthusiasm goes down and you're managing it not by wishful thinking but by choosing with intentional self-control what you focus your mind on, what you focus your time on, how you fill yourself with Christ and pour yourself into people. And I'll tell you, it's not a sprint. It's a long-term run. And to run a marathon, you have to learn to keep your enthusiasm over the long haul. And that's far more like our lives are. So I don't know where you are in this process. If you say, Paul, my spiritual level is really, I'm enthusiastic or you say, man, I am at the very bottom. I hope you begin to take responsibility to say, I need to make choices every day that are going to build my spiritual enthusiasm. And I need people around me that are going to pour into me and that will share with me and that I can pour into because that will help my focus be on what lasts and what matters. We're going to hand off to Green and to the South County campus, love you guys, excited to see what God is doing there. Let me give you a simple next step. Because I am so convinced that it's not what I say to you, it's what God says to you that's important. So as we've walked through this, you're saying this week I will build my spiritual passion by what? And my observation is if you have too many, you'll do nothing. So what is it you need to do? Do you need to stop the leaks? Is there a relationship you need to fight through the problems and get back to that simple act of giving honor? Do you have too many people needy in your life and not enough inspiring? Do you have nobody that you're training, that you're pouring into? I don't know what the answer is for you, but I know 
that the Holy Spirit would love to see transformation in your life. And this is one of the key secrets to it. How I manage my relationship with Christ and my enthusiasm for him and how I pour that out in the lives of the people around me. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for the example of Jesus as he lived here on earth and as he he dealt with all the same kinds of struggles and pressures that we do and how he managed in the middle of incredible busyness to have time to pull away and to pray and to spend time with you and how in spite of their fallibility he chose people to walk with him and to run with him and how he poured into people who didn't seem to get it for a long time. And Father, for those who are here today whose spiritual enthusiasm level is really low, give them the the courage and the strength to begin to focus on what's most important, the things that will last, the things that will matter, and help them to build that spiritual enthusiasm so that they are able to run the marathon And at the end of that, you will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Help us, God, wherever we are in whatever stage to hear what you're saying to us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say, we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.